This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Teaming up with the machines we've designed and created has boosted our production and let us attempt things we never could have before, but as artificial intelligence emerges, what will human machine teaming come to look like? Shortly after World War II, the newly formed US Air Force asked MIT to look into possible methods of air defense, and this led to the establishment of Lincoln Laboratories, one of the biggest and most prestigious R&D labs around, with a few thousand researchers and staff tasked with everything from traditional defense research to air traffic control, satellites, missile systems, biotechnology, cybersecurity, and now, artificial intelligence too. So when Rob Cedar asked me to give a presentation to Lincoln Labs on AI, My first thought was, what a great chance to pick some brains on any number of topics, and today's episode is the video form of the presentation I gave near the end of August, and the 2 hour Q&A session afterward has already spawned a few more episodes we release over the course of the year, and I wanted to thank everybody who participated in that and MIT Lincoln Labs for the opportunity, and for the wonderful brainstorm and episode ideas. Also, one notion we'll be addressing today is the concept that the best technology is invisible technology, and there's a different perspective I encountered just recently, that invisible technology is unethical technology, that we'll be looking at in a brief extended edition of today's episode over on Nebula. And now, without further ado, grab your drink and your snack and let's get started. So our topic today is human machine teaming, and we'll be looking at some of the misconceptions we have about AI, which we're discovering as our experience continues to grow. We're also going to look at several hypothetical situations where humanity exists alongside AI. We will look at the idea of the classic science fiction society where AI takes the form of humanoid robots, popularized in Isaac Asimov's robot novels. We will look at one where AI exists in a dumb form only, specialized but nowhere near human level. We will look at one where they exist in a super intelligent form as well, and where they are comparable to humans both human in behavior and intelligence and also where they are very inhuman in behavior. I want to start though by raising two key points. First, we need to acknowledge, going in, that while artificial intelligence is a term that's here to stay, it may not be the best one to use. Human intelligence is already just about the most artificial thing out there, especially pre-computers, in the context of artificial meaning something that's man-made. Every human is the product of years of time and energy invested into building what we think of as the modern human mind. As we head into the future and start considering things like mind augmentation, or even just new ways of interfacing with our devices, that line between human and machine, or natural and artificial, is going to get pretty blurry. There's essentially three conceptual ways to make an AI, you can program one, every single line of code, You can create a basic learning machine that self-programs, or you can copy existing examples by digitally uploading a mind, human or animal. In practice, we would probably expect to use some combination of these, but that last one, copying a human mind, is a parallel notion to mind uploading, and that's usually not seen as creating an artificial intelligence so much as transferring a human mind to a different substrate, neurons to silicon. Needless to say, there are a whole host of issues involved in transferring or copying a mind, especially to a different substrate, many of which we probably aren't even aware of yet. You can then tweak or copy that mind, possibly quite heavily, but eventually it would become rather blurry in terms of where it stopped being that original being. Would uploading a mind mean you've turned an organic intelligence into what we mean by a machine intelligence? Even that in itself is a pretty poorly defined concept, and that's just one example. I suspect that a search for a singular meaningful definition in the future is likely to be more than a little elusive. The second key point that we need to keep in mind is that often the ideal machine is one which is invisible, not that it's somehow secret or being used covertly, but just that it does its job so well that you don't have to pay attention to it. So when we get to contemplating human-machine teaming, we need to consider that the ideal machine teammate is one you barely are even aware of being on your team. So what is human-machine teaming? It is both easy and hard to define, but the easy definition is that it's a team of one or more humans and one or more machines performing tasks, including interactions they have while doing it. 
The reason this is hard to define is that it could be as simple as you teaming with a refrigerator, a knife, and a stove to produce a meal, a lawnmower to produce an attractive lawn, or a calculator to do your taxes. It raised the question of when does a machine go from being a tool to a teammate. It also raised the question of what a team is, since often the hallmark of a better or smarter machine is that it's using those upgrades to be less visible in its role, it just handles its job without drawing attention to itself, it's the wheel that does not squeak. And this can be a big distinction too, which we will highlight by contemplating our classic humanoid as Movian robot, one with sufficient intellect to chat with a human and not require highly detailed instructions. This is probably the human-machine civilization most familiar to us from fiction, and perhaps the least likely scenario in the real world, and yet it offers us much insight. It is the world of android butlers, servants, and sex bots. It's the one that instantly brings a fear of machine rebellions and requires something like Asmo's Three Laws, that the android can't let humans be harmed or disobey them, and that those take priority over its own survival. This introduces all sorts of issues for how to determine when a human is in peril, both in terms of what qualifies as harm and recognizing it when it's going on. Both of those have to be achieved before you even get to discuss correct moral decisions, like what a robot should do if it sees the classic trolley problem, a trolley running down a track out of control about to hit five people, which you can prevent by switching the trolley to a different track so it runs over one person instead. This may come up with self-driving vehicles, or human-machine teaming to drive vehicles, when the computer has to decide between various bad alternatives, each with margins of error and uncertainty for how bad they will be. We can pick those famous laws of robotics apart, but it is a wasted exercise since 80 years after the Grandmaster of Science Fiction first wrote them down, we have managed to incorporate computers into every aspect of life without ever needing them. And then of course there's also the issue of how difficult it would be to actually implement such rules. You need a computer brain that understands how a human can be harmed before it can avoid harming us, one that can appreciate and understand tasks before being ordered to do them. Essentially, it needs to be as smart as a human in order to be an android, whereas honestly about the least needed type of AI is a human intelligent one. We have no shortage of people after all, and we have little desire to make a world in which humans are superfluous. This is another relic of early AI and Android contemplation. When Asimov discussed why in his stories the main rationale with humanoid robots was that a brain was much more expensive than most hardware, most of which sits idle much of the time, so it made more sense to move a robotic brain back and forth from each bit of hardware, be it a tractor or a bulldozer or a vacuum cleaner, and that a human form was already built into those devices, so the robot brain might as well be on a human-shaped platform. It seemed plausible enough, and while computers are now a lot cheaper, there is certainly lots of hardware that sits idle most days and is built and time tested around the human shape. However, it misses three other critical concepts. Firstly, multitasking and remote control mostly eliminates the need to have one Android walking around to various devices it would control when instead it could just be remote controlling them or even popping in for any decision beyond the skill of the tiny computer built into the device. Second, There is a huge difference in the complexity and sophistication of brain hardware and software needed for various tasks, many of which can be done with ridiculously little brains when specialized to that lone purpose. Finally, while we often envision robots replacing blue-collar labor-focused tasks, farms and factories and so on, in practice they tended to do at least as well when replacing white-collar jobs. Indeed the word computer used to be a job title for folks who computed things, definitely a white-collar job. So this has never really been the case, computers principally getting rid of blue collar not white collar positions, but folks still tend to think of automated unemployment as hitting factories not offices. In fact one of Asmo's original robot short stories, Galley Slave, contemplates a robot whose job it was to check proofs, a harbinger of spelling autocorrect that highlights the assumptions of the time, about both how incredibly easy some tasks were to automate and not need anything like a human level of intellect, while others that were assumed to be fairly easy to automate have turned out far harder. For instance in that story the robot is accused of having tampered with the writing of an academic to make him look a fool, though in truth he tampered with the work himself and is tricked into admitting it by assuming the robot was about to testify against him when in reality it was rising to his defense, preparing to lie in accordance with its first law compulsion to protect humans, including their professional reputation. 
It is worth noting that there is a big difference in the tasks it's designed to do and some of the others it performs in the story. It was designed for the act of checking the spelling, grammar, and page layout that was the robot's actual purpose, and one modern computers perform quite well, at least with human involvement. However, in the story we see two other duties it performs, first being able to assess a concept like professional reputation, and second, allegedly tampering with the paper to make him look like a fool. These are so far apart in complexity with spelling and grammar checking as to be comparing running a lone telegraph wire with setting up the modern internet. Though it is worth noting that modern spell check is not something we can let work by itself in a vacuum, it catches likely errors and suggests likely corrections. We wouldn't trust it to edit a whole book independently as we saw in the story, especially an academic one. In our story our academic frames the robot for the crime of tampering for non-selfish purposes, he was motivated by his fear that the automation of academic work would destroy the dignity of scholarship. He argues that EZ-27 is a harbinger of a world in which a scholar would be left with only a barren choice of what orders to issue to robot researchers. I was going to say we can all agree spelling autocorrect is hardly a threat to scholarship, but to be fair my spelling and grammar has definitely not improved since I started using word processors though some folks say it's helped theirs. It also reminds me of those early help bots, the paperclip office assistant Microsoft inflicted on us around the turn of the century, which in my discussion with Rob Cedar preparing for this presentation, he raised as an example of why good technology is often invisible technology. The paperclip was annoying even though it performed many of the same functions as later templating tools, automatic spelling correction and grammar checkers that are widely accepted. We accept those functions, but not the anthropomorphized bot visibly performing them. That's maybe an even bigger reason why androids probably won't be ubiquitous in future civilizations. They will be around, but beyond the rebellion and slavery fears and issues, beyond the uncanny valley creepiness of anything near human but not quite, their near humanity also makes them hard to ignore and let slip into the background. While we can take for granted there will be some androids around, my hunch is that they will only be used where nothing else really fits, rather than some universal device everyone has that is the main form AI takes, the Android Cupbearer. But this highlights two alternative universes for humans and machines, the highly intelligent one that replaces even academics, and the one in which only dumb machines exist. We will return to the super intelligent one in a bit, but it is worth noting that even as we contemplate these alternate scenarios for human machine civilizations, they are not necessarily either or options, as a civilization might go through phases, while we also might see a civilization have cultures that use machines differently. To reference Asimov again, he had a spacefaring humanity that embraces robots while their earthbound cousins reject human form ones, though still use sophisticated computers and still have plenty of automation. We might assume that a spacefaring humanity seeking to settle or build a million worlds or more might need to embrace AI and automation, but in practice you might expect to see a wide spectrum of attitudes and usages across those many worlds, and those shifting with generations too. I also would not expect space travel, terraforming, or building space habitats to really require human level AI. We also need to keep in mind that people don't have to like a given machine to be willing to use it, or let it be employed on their behalf. Using AI to run your sleeper ship to a distant ward and unleash the von Neumann self-replicating terraforming machines on the ward below does not mean that you plan to have a permanent commitment to AI. They are the dirty tool to be discarded or used only by the carefully chosen and trained leper designated for that unclean role. Even some very automated artificial habitat and ecosystem, like what we might see on board an O'Neill Cylinder space habitat, might only need fairly simplistic AI running this or that system quietly in the background like some unseen genius loci. It may be very dumb and non-threatening, in part because of its fairly limited purpose. A water recycling system is likely to have little ambition, even if it is a fairly sophisticated one that included organic components in its operation, like growing plants or utilizing genetically modified animals to serve as its worker bees. That might be an example of animal machine teaming, and, same as human machine teaming, will often involve AI that's only animal intelligence, or even insect intelligence. We would be likely to see examples of animal machine teaming, like the upgrade on the pet door that opens only for your pet with the right chip implanted in them. Or the sophisticated system that actually employed animals in its work. If you've got a park and an AI running it, a system that can manipulate the critters living in there to do the work might be rather appealing. Given that a park isn't a park without nature, 
and if it needs to have squirrels, having them gene tweak to pick up garbage might be a better option than some robot doing it. You can achieve higher squirrel density in the park by having depots that dispense supplemental food in exchange for garbage, which might have some interesting evolutionary consequences like garbage hoarding akin to nut collecting. There too, an alternative to humanoid robots is animal form ones which would tend to avoid some of the issues we have with androids. But on the flip side, if it only needs an animal mind, maybe it's easy just to tailor an animal to the task instead. It helps that we understand and are familiar with the big gaps in brain power these days between humans and AI, so people are not getting freaked out by the robot vacuum or lawnmower, or worrying that Alexa and Siri are secretly plotting rebellion. So a case like that of Frank Herbert's Dune, where they essentially forbid any and all computerization seems unlikely, though technically the official rule was no thinking machines and thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. That may be good advice in a lot of cases, since they are precious few tasks that really need a human mind to do them, and there's currently no shortage of human minds. While for the sake of argument or story we can theorize about human culture so fearful of AI that they reject even robot vacuums or simple smart appliances, it would not seem likely to be the norm. We might also want to ask, in regard to human-machine teaming, exactly what a team really is. They might vary from the absolute monarchy sort of team, where everyone is effectively a slave to a control system, be it a human or Skynet, to something more like a marriage which to be fair come in a wide variety of team styles too, or it could be more like humans and their pets, or super intelligent AI with humans as their pets, or the trusted teacher almost symbiotically paired to someone from childhood and specialized in teaching or protection, even as others might be specialized in sales, diplomacy, arbitration, psychiatry, or any number of other tasks that require high level human interaction but might not need real humanity. This teaming can be beneficial though, As an example, while computers can win at chess against any human now, that was the big popular test around the turn of the century, machines like IBM's Deep Blue beating chess masters. For a while after though, we found that team games where a human and AI worked together to pick moves was beating both machines and humans separately for a time. It is quite possible this sort of teaming will produce the best results for many endeavors, at least for a period of time. This isn't a new idea either, just one we tend not to think on much. We have a term called externalized cognition, and a simple example of that would be a human performing arithmetic and augmenting their ability with the use of a pencil and paper, or abacus or calculator. Back in our Hive Minds episode, we discussed this as an example of a very limited form of networked intelligence, much as spoken or gestured language is a simple example of allowing humans to network to other humans present and writing allows networking to those separated by much distance in time, such that books permit networking dead people into your cogitation. Now we are contemplating probably much more intense and potentially intrusive networking, externalized cognition or partnerships, and that marriage analogy of a moment ago makes me think of the commonly used wording of two becoming one. One example we might see of this in civilizations is mind augmentation, where all the machines are very directly integrated into the person. They may be so networked together that it's effectively creating a new entity, not a human but a transhuman or posthuman, which might be pretty human in behavior still or wildly inhuman. This is another path to human-style AI though, since while we can't see how the android might be unpleasant for me to live with, there is certainly a path for customer service AI that upgrades on what we see with automated phone systems and customer service chatbots. There's also room for virtual assistants and of course virtual people in virtual worlds. These need not be genuine AI, but characters encountered in virtual settings probably need to be able to ratchet up their capability when a human comes by to interact with them, possibly even to fully human, which conjures for me the image of some techno-tentacular AI with 10,000 masks it donned as needed for a few minutes here and there, except those masks aren't really an act and it's not really a person because it doesn't really have a true personality of its own. Or it does, its true personality may not be any of the apparent personalities or anything we could even recognize as a human style personality. That is a good reminder that we don't want to be assuming an AI necessarily has any parallel to humanity going on. A specialist intelligence designed for a purpose, even if that purpose is pretending to be characters in a virtual world, might not be very human in mindset. Indeed, the best AI for human interaction in some virtual utopia might be one that is very inhuman rather than human. 
On the note of specialists though, we should also consider that instead of AI taking on a decision making role, they might tend to be specialized to the point of being more like a cabinet of government advisors than Prime Minister, or President, or King. Some other AI or a human might play that role. We often see the notion in sci-fi of courts having judges who are actually computers because they are magically objective and unbiased for reasons I've never been clear on. While that is a real possibility, we might want to consider them instead as merely a judge while a human jury still sits on the case. They certainly have a role in courts though since the stenographer is slowly on its way out in favor of auto-transcription and we're seeing an increase in a lot of simple legal documents being in template or automated formats, so too we increasingly use it in studying the effectiveness of sentencing approaches or unseen biases in the sentencing and incarceration system. We might also want to consider that an AI might not just hold some office like that of a judge or a cabinet member, but might actually embody the office in a very literal sense. When we talk about corporate personhood, we aren't really thinking that Pepsi or Microsoft is going to show up, take the witness stand, and testify. We mean some officer or employee of the company will. So too, we might see many networked AIs that can upgrade their degree of interconnectedness when needed to form more of a complex hive mind, something like Voltron, it only gets super smart when it needs to be. But that takes us to the topic of super intelligent AI. And we often envision that as either being the end of humanity, Skynet Extinction style, or with humanity as pets, which some might consider just as bad. Of course it depends on what kind of pet we mean, I'm a cat person so my default view of their existence of a pet is a bit different, my cat doesn't come when I call unless it feels like it. And it does actually have a job it performs as I live in a rural area where mice and moles and such often pester the home or garden. Because of this, I'd also have no reason to seek out a robot that does that job better. Relationships with dogs, horses, and other pet animals are very different, and even different now than the past, where it was much more of a survival and work-based relationship. So too, there are lots of pets which are also food animals, and folks often get very emotionally attached to the family milk cow even if they cheerfully eat beef, or cheerfully raise that cow's occasional and necessary offspring to eat. It's a bit of a grisly notion, but when contemplating humans as pets of super-intelligent AI, we probably want to ask what we mean by pet in much the same way we ask what we mean by team. It might not be too implausible either. It's our habit to say that AI is capable of being even more alien to us than aliens, since it wouldn't even share that common biological and evolutionary imperatives an alien should, but we do need to keep in mind that we made it and it grew up in our civilization, initially reliant on our collected knowledge and views, and there's a lot of ways it could end up with the same sort of prejudices and attitudes and viewpoints as humans, again we're artificial intelligences too. Now, classically in sci-fi, the smart machine just gets super smart without anyone noticing at some point, or seems to have way too much intelligence programmed into it. In the example of Skynet, it's a defense control computer, it is unclear why it should ever have had file control on ICBMs or even why it needed all that intelligence. If its only job was missile tracking or missile guidance for instance, or tracking units and putting them up on the big board, why would that imply any need for learning abilities? Going back to the notion that an Asmovian robot needs vastly more processing power to obey the three laws than to do any task we might possibly assign it, we have that wonderful scene of Iron Man and the Hulk fighting in the Avengers Age of Ultron, where Tony Stark asks his digital assistant how quickly they can buy a building that's under construction right before he rams the Hulk down it. It makes one wonder why that AI has that capacity built in. On the one hand it seems like a good capacity for a superhero suit to have, being able to help with the cleanup from the fights. On the other hand, that's a very high level and unrelated skill to running a suit that's essentially a superhuman exoskeleton and weapons platform. It is also a good example of how a powerful capability granted in a comic book or sci-fi story overlooks its other awesome uses, many of which are even better uses than the author imagined. So for instance, would it be small enough to know to just buy things Iron Man had damaged or send compensation to the owner, or maybe to do a lot of subtle insider trading like rapidly looking up every business that might plausibly benefit from that damage, either as a competitor or someone hired to fix it and buy stock in them? That sort of quick search and sort is exactly the type of thing our current AIs excel at after all. One might also wonder how a civilization would try to prove itself against such vulnerabilities, though it might do so through sheer complexity. If everyone has their own Jarvis, they presumably start interfering with that kind of insurance trick. The thing about digital critters like this is you can presumably copy them very easily. 
That does raise the democracy issue with AI too, much like with full-on duplication style cloning, where it produces a fully formed and thinking human complete with memories. Presumably we would need a way to prevent folks, or AI folks at least, from just copying their brain a billion times the day before an election. Do all duplicate AIs get a single vote because they are identical? How much divergence of mind would be enough to truly claim unique personhood and warrant a separate vote? Whether it's a copied human or a copied AI, an uploaded human or a super intelligent anima, how different does one intelligence need to be from another to qualify as a unique entity that would get a vote? Keep in mind that two different styles of AI are likely to vary from each other more than squid and chimpanzees, and that when you get down to it, humans really are near copies of each other. We talk about differences in DNA and note that no two humans have identical DNA, even twins. Indeed a single human doesn't have the exact same DNA in all parts of their body and at all points in time. The difference between two mostly genetically different living humans is sort of like if you had two identical libraries of books and changed maybe a few thousand sentences throughout the entire collection of tens of thousands of books, so we probably do not want to fixate on basic DNA or blueprints as proof of individuality if AI starts demanding the vote. In the future, determining levels of uniqueness might be as important as trying to decide how much brains it takes to be a person and warrant a vote, or how close to a human in mindset and personality one has to be to claim personhood. Definitely a place for caution though, as the history around the Three-Fifths Compromise informs us, and we might want to ask if we really want to retread that ground of trying to bargain or calculate how human somebody is. And to reference Asimov one more time in all this, we probably want to be careful how tight we make that definition of a human or person, so we don't start excluding actual people. In his story The Positronic Man, we see the journey of a robot trying to become increasingly human, with various politicians constantly redefining and narrowing the conditions to keep him excluded, as he slowly adds in organic parts to his robot body, while many a human gets robotic prosthetics. They eventually rule that the intrinsic bit of a human is the meat brain, and he goes and gets one, which is the tragic and fatal ending of that wonderful story. Of course this presumably would mean no one in their society could do a mind upload to a computer and virtual existence, or android body, without losing their human rights. So to close out, we looked at several different types of civilizations with several different flavors of human machine teaming as a theme, and I'd be curious what you think might be stable or plausible, and for that matter, desirable, and if not, what variation or combination might address potential issues. As we move ever closer to when these issues stop being fiction or even academic, it probably will behoove us to start asking which of these we'd find desirable, or at least acceptable, and start aiming our civilization's ship that way while we still get to be the ones manning the helm. There's always a lot of prep work leading up to any episode, and that included one of our regular editors, Jerry Gurn, forwarding me a fairly long presentation on AI by the great Ben Schneiderman himself after the presentation and the episode was already complete. And this was a big inspiration for me writing a draft for upcoming episode Criminal AI coming out in late October, but there was one comment in there I wanted to bring into today's discussion, and that's the notion that the best AI is invisible AI that we had earlier, versus his own comment that invisible AI is unethical AI. And so we have an extended episode of our show coming out today on Nebula to discuss those two notions, and if they can both be true. Now our extended editions on Nebula are longer, but we make up for those by cutting out all the ad and sponsor reads and releasing them a couple days early. We also didn't get a chance to talk too much about using robots in space, and there's a great show, Space Robot Revolution, over on Curiosity Stream that looks at the past, present, and future of robots in space. Curiosity Stream is home of thousands of great educational videos and documentaries, and they partnered up with us at Nebula, home of dozens of independent creators like myself, to offer Nebula as a free bonus if you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link in our episode description. That lets you see content like Space Robot Revolution and watch all the other amazing content on CuriosityStream, and also all the great content over on Nebula from myself and many others. Ad free and early, and you get all of that for less than $15 by using a link in the episode's description. So that will wrap us up for today, but not for the week, as this weekend we have our monthly Sci-Fi Sunday episode on Stealth Spaceships coming out and we'll challenge the show's usual claim that stealth in space is impossible by asking why and what might get around that limitation. And two weeks from now we'll scale that up to look not just at hiding spaceships but entire civilizations, 
as we return to the Fermi Paradox for Hidden Civilizations. Before that though, next week we will celebrate the 7th anniversary of our first episode, Megastructures in Science and Science Fiction, by looking at Megastructure Death on September 16th. Then we will have our monthly livestream Q&A on Sunday, September 26th at 4pm Eastern Time, before closing the month out by asking if it's possible for future civilizations to exist without money on September 30th. Now if you want to make sure you get notified when those episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed the episode don't forget to hit the like button and share it with others. If you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon or our website IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link to in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concept of the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.